Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to take a look at the bar electret, which as the name implies is sort of the electric analogue of a bar magnet. And the analogy is that while a bar magnet has a uniform magnetization vector within its volume, a bar electret has a uniform polarization vector within its volume. So while a lot of materials will only have a non-zero polarization if you apply uh, an external electric field to them, there are materials that have this sort of built-in polarization and these are the materials you could use to make one of these electrets. So specifically what we want to do is think about how the field lines of both the electric field E and the electric displacement field D produced by this electret look both inside and outside its volume. And it turns out that this is quite an interesting thing to do because it illustrates some important differences between these two fields and also illustrates uh, how the standard relation D equals epsilon E doesn't always apply. And in fact, you can have your electric fields and your displacement field pointing in almost opposite directions. Now, as it turns out, the displacement field is actually a little bit easier to understand. So we're going to start with trying to sketch some field lines of D. And in order to do that, we just need to remind ourselves of some important equations relating to the displacement field. So let's just note down some potentially useful equations. A good place to start would be the definition of the displacement field. So it's defined such that D is epsilon naught times the electric field plus the polarization vector. Now, if we're trying to sketch field lines, we need to know about things like the divergence and the curl of D as well. Now D has this very useful property that its divergence is given by the free charge density in the system, where free charge is just any charge that's not a result of polarization. Now, in this particular system, you will have charges accumulating in certain places on the electret because of the polarization of the negative and positive charges, but there are no free charges. Everything is a result of polarization. So in this particular case, the divergence of D is going to be zero. Now, what about the curl of D? What can we say about that? Well, take equation one and just take the curl of both sides and you find that the curl of D is uh, epsilon naught times the curl of E and then plus uh, curl of P. But if we assume that nothing is time varying, in particular, we don't have any time varying magnetic fields around, then one of Maxwell's equations tells us that the curl of E is just zero and therefore the curl of D is exactly the same as the curl of P. So what do these equations tell us about the shape of the field lines? Well, equation two, the divergence being zero, tells us that there are no sources or sinks of D in this particular system. And the only way that that can happen, unless D itself is zero everywhere, um, is for the field lines to form closed loops so that they sort of don't start anywhere, don't end anywhere, they just form these, uh, these loops. Now that already sounds very reminiscent of the field lines that you get produced by either a solenoid or a bar magnet, right? Your B field lines form closed loops. And we can take that analogy even further and notice that uh, equation three, curl D equals curl of P, um, is a bit reminiscent of uh, the fact that the curl of the B field is proportional to the current density uh, in magnetostatics. So what that means is you're going to have closed loops of D field which circulate around the curl of P, whatever that vector field looks like, in the same way that the B field would circulate around uh, the current in a solenoid. So then the next thing we need to do is figure out how this vector field given by curl P looks in all regions of space. Now this is easy in two places. It's easy in the bulk of the electret because the polarization is assumed to be uniform, therefore it doesn't have any curl inside the electret. And also outside the electret, there is no material, so there's no polarization. And so the curl is zero outside as well. The only place where the curl can be non-zero is on the boundary, on the border between the electret and the rest of space. Now you'll run into some problems if you try to actually calculate the curl of P because it changes discontinuously at the boundary between the electret and the rest of space. It goes from some non-zero value immediately to a zero value and therefore its derivatives are formally undefined. So if you wanted to actually do this numerically, then you would have to come up with a slightly more physically realistic model where, um, for example, the polarization reduces from P down to zero over some small uh, length scale of the edge of the electret. But we can still do this qualitatively and figure out the shape of the field lines using a sort of discontinuous model. Now you have to remember that in vector calculus, what the curl is really measuring is the circulation of a vector field around a given point where circulation is just the line integral of the vector field around some small closed loop. And that curl vector also points in the direction of maximum circulation at any given point. So you have to imagine doing many, many possible line integrals uh, around any given point, figuring out which particular 
orientation of uh, that loop would give you the maximum value of the circulation and then the curl vector points normal to that loop um, in an orientation defined by the right hand rule. Now that all probably sounds a little bit abstract and complicated, but it's not that bad when we put it into practice because all we really have to do is go around the various surfaces of the electorate, consider these little circulation loops that I was talking about, and uh, you then use the right hand rule to establish what direction the curl should be pointing in on each surface. So I've started by drawing just one such circulation loop up at the top of our little cylinder. And if you think about doing the line integral of P uh, along that loop, you can see that uh, on the bottom edge of the loop, you're integrating in the same direction as P. So you're gonna get some positive contribution to your line integral um, on that edge. You're gonna get zero contribution on the vertical edges um, because your line element, right, your little DL or DS in your line integral is perpendicular to the P vector. And so the dot product of them would be zero. So you don't get any contribution to your line integral from the vertical side. Similarly, you don't get any contribution to your line integral from the side at the top because there is no polarization outside um, the electorate. So what that means is that the curl at the top of the electorate, as I've drawn it on the screen, is coming out of the screen because if you take your right hand, curl your fingers around in the orientation um, of the little loop that I've drawn, your thumb will be pointing towards you and that's the correct orientation because we get a positive circulation. And of course that same logic works anywhere along that horizontal line at the top of the electorate and so you can put a whole bunch of vectors coming out of the screen um, along that line. So what if we were to then repeat that same sort of exercise along the bottom of the electorate? Well, if we keep our sense of the integration the same, in other words, we integrate anti-clockwise, you're now going to get a negative contribution to your line integral along the top part of that loop because you're integrating to the left, but P is uh, going to the right. So they are anti-parallel to get negative contribution. For the same reasons as before, you're going to have zero contribution from the vertical sides, and you're also going to have zero contribution outside where there is no polarization um, and so this time your circulation is negative and that means that the curl vector should be pointing in the exact opposite direction that it was along the top. So you could put a bunch of circles with crosses in them to indicate that your curl p vector field is going into the screen all the way along that line at the bottom and you can see this analogy between electrodes and uh, either magnets or solenoids getting stronger and stronger because in a solenoid or a magnet you have currents flowing along the uh, circumference in the same way that we have this curl P in a sense flowing along the circumference of our electorate. I should probably also color code this and label in red curl P just so that we remember what those um, dots and crosses represent. Maybe I'll leave it as an exercise for the viewer to figure out why there is no curl of P um, on the two flat faces of the electorate, but you can just repeat pretty much the same analysis that we just did and you'll find that the line integral around any closed loop um, at the surfaces, the flat surfaces, would be zero. So putting all of this together, we conclude that the D field lines of this bar electorate have to look exactly the same as the B field lines of a bar magnet or a solenoid. And so we can draw them on circulating in the appropriate senses like we've done here. I've drawn them as ellipses. They're not actually perfectly elliptical, but um, as, a, as a rough sketch, this gets across the, the general idea of the shape of the D field lines. So now we have to think about the electric field E, and this is where things get potentially a little bit surprising. We're going to start by thinking about the shape of the field lines outside the electorate, because that's the easiest thing to do. Um, if you just look at equation one, D is epsilon or E plus P, uh, the P vector is zero outside the electorate, and so that implies that the E field is just one over epsilon naught times the D field. In other words, E is indeed proportional to D outside the electorate. We already know the shape of the D field lines and therefore the E field lines are going to have essentially the same shape numerically. Uh, the value of E and the value of D um, are gonna be different. They're in different units as well, but the shape of the field will be the same because they just differ by this scalar factor of one over epsilon naught. So I've just sketched on the field lines of E outside the electorate. Now we've got to deal with the case inside the electorate. Now here we've got to use the full version of the uh, displacement field equation. So it's no longer true that E is just one over epsilon naught times D. Now it's one over epsilon naught times D minus P just by rearranging that equation one over on the left. And I think the best way to figure out what this means about the shape of the E field um, is by using some vector addition diagrams. So to illustrate what I mean by that, let's say you want to find out what the electric field looks like in this particular region that I've just circled on my diagram, which corresponds to this same region um, on the diagram down at the bottom left. So you can see from the lower left diagram of the D field lines that your D vector is pointing sort of down and to the right. 
um, at that particular place. So let me draw a little down to the right arrow labels D. Then we want to subtract P from that, or equivalently, we want to add on the vector minus P. Now P is pointing to the right and therefore minus P is pointing to the left. So I can draw a polarization vector, well, a minus polarization vector uh, like that. And then you do your vector addition from the tail of the D vector to the head of the minus P vector. And you find out that your E vector has to look like this little blue arrow here. Really that's epsilon naught E, but then uh, E is gonna be in the same direction as that because it just differs by a scalar. You could then repeat that same sort of analysis over on the right hand side of the interior of the electrode. And this time from the diagram at the bottom left, you see that your D field is sort of pointing uh, up and to the right. Your minus P vector is always in the same direction because P is uniform. So this is your D field on the right. This is your minus P vector there. Um, and so this time by vector addition, you find that your E field vector must be pointing uh, sort of up and to the left. So then the only conclusion is that the E field lines must look like the ones that I've just drawn onto my diagram where they sort of bulge outwards towards the edge of the electorate and they point in almost the opposite direction to, uh, to where the D field lines were pointing um, in the previous diagram. Notice also that I've left these little gaps between the field lines um, where they suddenly change direction because they're really different field lines, like a field line can't just suddenly flip its direction. So we've really got sets of, of two distinct types of field lines inside and outside the electorate. Now, since this seems a little bit strange, perhaps let's see if we can justify what's going on and understand uh, physically, intuitively why this is. And fortunately, it's quite easy to do that because what's going on is your polarization is going to cause positive charges to accumulate on the right-hand face and negative charges to accumulate on the left-hand face. So you're gonna get a surface charge density. I'm gonna write plus sigma bound the bound charge density because it's a result of polarization. The magnitude of that surface charge density is the same as the magnitude um, of the polarization vector. I've got another video deriving that result if you want to see why that is. Um, but anyway, on the opposite face, you're going to have an equal and opposite um, charge density, surface charge density, just given by minus the magnitude of the P vector. Now, electric field lines uh, start and end on any type of charge, whether it's free or bound, and they always go from plus to minus. And so if you consider the fact that you've got, for example, only positive charges on the right-hand side face, you can only ever have field lines coming out of that face, right? It wouldn't make sense to have circulating electric field lines. They have to be emerging from that face and they have to be going into the other face because electric field lines always go in towards um, negative charges. Mathematically, that's equivalent to saying that the divergence is positive over on the right-hand side, while the divergence is negative over on the left-hand side, which is also um, consistent with Maxwell's equations and the idea of all charge as being sources and sinks of E field lines. And finally, while we're talking about consistency with Maxwell's equations, it might be interesting for you to uh, repeat the exercise that we were doing earlier when we considered those little circulation loops and thought about the signs of um, those line integrals. Imagine doing a line integral over a loop in this sort of region here and see if you can convince yourself that the line integral of the electric field there um, would need to be zero. And again, that's consistent with what Maxwell's equations tell us. So anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for watching. Hope it's been interesting and I'll see you soon.